Okay. Cool thing about isotopes is that in order to really use them effectively, it kind of forces you to study other disciplines. Okay, and I've kind of mentioned this before, but I'm going to hammer this point home. If you want to know something about what whales eat, right? Oh, sorry. If you want to know something about what whales eat, you better know something about their physiology. Okay? You also better know something about oceanography because whales can move and they move fast, especially blue whales. They're like the fastest moving whale. Okay, it's hard to get samples of blue whales. We've tried. We have to take a really fast boat and sneak up on them and then put a, a biopsy projectile point in their backs. They don't, they don't worry about it. It doesn't, work. It doesn't hurt them, um, but they're really hard to sample because they move so quickly. So in order to interpret their isotopic information, you, know, you need to know something about changes in the baseline, i.e. what whales are eating over space and time. Okay, so you might have to know something about oceanography. If you're interested, um, and using strontium isotopes to study animal movement. You might have to know something about geology, right? Because geology basically dictates what the strontium isotope composition is of the food that that animal eats in a given place, and so on and so forth. As Diane mentioned a few nights ago, if you want to know something about urban ecology using isotopes, you better know something about sociology. A lot of her graphs were socioeconomic, right? There was like how much people made? What part of town did you live in? What your behavior was like? You need to know something about human behavior and anthropology even. So it forces you to study other disciplines. It broadens your perspective and that's a really cool thing about this. Okay, so let's talk about discrimination. Trophic discrimination. Like I said, you are what you eat, sort of. There's an offset. So if you're talking about this tuna here and its prey, there's a difference between the tuna in both carbon and nitrogen isotopes. Let's say it's one per mil for carbon and three per, per mil for nitrogen. There's biological, or sorry, biochemical and physiological processes. And the two we're going to talk about today are decarboxylation and deamination. So as this tuna breathes, it's breathing out light CO2. Okay, so the carbon dioxide that we're exhaling right now is a little bit lighter than the food that we ate. It's a little bit lighter than our bodies. That means that the carbon that's left behind in our bodies has more 13C in it, okay? So if you lose the 12C, the 13C stays, and that's what you use to do work, right? That's what you use to make tissues. And that's why you're isotopically enriched in comparison to your food. Simple. Similarly, for nitrogen, you lose light nitrogen because you pee it out. If you're a tuna, you pee out ammonia. If you're a human, you pee out urea, okay? And that is isotopically depleted in comparison to what's left behind. So you're losing 14N. If you're losing 14N, your pool is 15N enriched. And therefore, the stuff that you're using to make your tissues has higher nitrogen isotope values than your food. Does that make sense? Simple, that's the basic concept. Okay. And like I said, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, carbon isotope discrimination factors are about 0 to 2 per mil. They range a little bit higher than that. And about 2 to 5 per mil for nitrogen. Okay. There's some variation there. And some of that variation we can explain, and some of that variation has yet to be explained. <laughs> Hence, potential projects and careers. Okay. But it's cool that we can do this because it means we can reconstruct food webs. This is one of my awesome students. Emma Elliott Smith, she studies kelp forests. You wonder, you wonder why? Hey, she's in New Mexico. How does she study kelp forests? There's these things called jets. And you just get on a jet and you get out to California, you get colonies. It's great. In this particular system, different primary producers have different carbon isotope values. That's good. Kelp is higher than, than microalgae. This is phytoplankton, and the greens and reds are somewhere in between. Okay, so we can, we can, you don't want to study as an isotope ecologist a system that has no isotopic variation. That's boring. Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> it won't be fruitful. And then you can use this variation at the base of the food chain, and you can start looking at different invertebrate consumers here, primary consumers, and what their isotopic distribution is like. And then you can look at different secondary consumers, predators and scavengers, and what their isotopic composition is like. And what M is actually interested in is this apex predator up here that eats everything, and what their isotopic composition is like. And what Emma's question is, or one of the questions she's addressing with her dissertation, is of the carbon in this animal, how much comes from that versus that? Okay? 
So it's kind of an ecosystem level question. She wants to know, of the otter, how much of its carbon that's, made to, that's used to make the otter, how much of it comes from kelp? Okay? And she's using actually compound specific approach to do this. But the point is, is that isotopes are really cool because it allows you to reconstruct this complexity and the structure of this food web. All right? And trace energy flow from the base to the top in a variety of different ways. So as I mentioned, trophic discrimination factors are generally positive. So why are they positive? That's what we're going to get into. And the answer, of course, is physiology and biochemistry. Anybody have any questions up to this point? I like how you guys just jump in. I shouldn't, we shouldn't even have these pauses. Well, we should, but you just ask. Just keep doing that. You don't have to save your questions. Sir? She's actually looking at bone. Because she, um, bone collagen, because it's a long-term integrator of what they eat. And the cool thing is, is that she wants to know whether the, the carbon sources that were made, that were used to make the sea otter today, were different than they are 100 or 1,000 years ago. And so she can get bone collagen from historical specimens and from archaeological sites to look at the relative importance of kelp over time. That's her thing. What is, is she working from Alaska to California, so does she have the gradient and predation by killer whales? Mm -hmm. Yep. Actually, she's extended it now. She, next month, she leaves and she goes to Chile to work in the kelp forest in the Atacama. Yeah. 